Hello and welcome to our monthly live broadcast. It's a little bit earlier this month because we're going to be getting ready for the course. Uh, I don't know that we'll even have a live broadcast next month, <coughs> but we do have the course. So if you're interested, you can head over and sign up for the new boiled tea course, which will start on the 21st of November. Uh, it's not going to be live, so it's a little different than the Intro to Cha Dao course that we did earlier this year. Um, it's going to be filmed beforehand. So it really just launches on the 21st. So you can really watch it at your own pace. I think that's really the advantage of online courses. They have disadvantages too that we can't sit together and share tea, obviously. But they have this advantage that you can watch it at your own pace and it like is landing right in your home, in your space, in your life, and in your schedule. I think that's its advantage and we need to play to that advantage. So that's why we're pre-recording it. It allows us to show a little bit more too because we're not stuck just at this table uh, because of the Wi-Fi and stuff. We can move the camera a little bit if we need to. Should be exciting. Boiled tea, probably my favorite brewing method. It's really uh, such a wonderful joy. Uh, not only is it amongst the most ancient ways of brewing tea, but it's also unlocks all kinds of things in tea that are otherwise inaccessible. Both, uh, you know, physical characteristics, you could say chemistry, but also ceremonial and, and spiritual aspects of tea that are only available through boiling. There's a real magic in it, and I, I'm excited. It's going to be a lot of fun to explore this topic. I hope you guys are excited, too. We have a bunch of boiled tea sets also up on the website right now uh, that are discounted, both um, side handle and cauldron, because we're going to be going through in the course cauldron boiling, side handle boiling, all different kinds of boiling. And then we have some sets of tea that are really ideal for boiling as well so that you can pick up. So... All of that's uh, super, super exciting. Before we get started with the questions and answers today, as usual, let's start with uh, three bowls of tea in silence together. I'll take off my mic so you don't have to hear me slurping.
All right, that was nice, huh? That's the best way to start any conversation. So, we have these live broadcasts. We can chat about all things tea and uh, about if you like the magazine this month, which is about flowers, Chabana. We can talk about that or the tea of the month or if you have other tea questions as well. Uh, remember, if you're a Global Tea Up member, because it seems like a lot, a lot of members, a lot of people watch the broadcast after the actual live time. Maybe this time is not suitable to where you live or to your lifestyle. Uh, so you can go into the Group Tiat app and there's a section to put questions. So you could kind of park your question there and then uh, we'll get to that. And then even if you're not have available or cannot come to the live broadcast, we can answer your question, discuss your question, explore your question together, and you can then still receive an answer later on. So Questions. Uh, what is the best way to start experimenting with oil tea? Is there any special tea where needed? The best way to start experimenting with boiled tea is to sign up for our boiled tea course, which launches on the 21st of November. Uh, if you sign up beforehand, it'll be cheaper. So after the 21st of November, it's going to go up in price so that you're incentivized to sign up. Um, yeah, and in that course, we're going to cover every, all the details of starting a boiled tea practice and uh, all the different methods, all the different types of teaware that you could use um, and what you need. And we have a, a, a page up on the website now. We can link it below. It's a, uh, for we're selling some boiled tea sets at discount for the course, so you can get all the teaware that you need as well for the preparing for the course and uh, there yeah there are two kind of main methods cauldron brewing and side handle there's actually three we're going to go over all of them um, or maybe four if there's one four or five actually if you include some like kind of subsidiary ones and we'll cover all that everything that you need to know So that's a great way to get started, and it's affordable, and um, the course, we try to keep them, you know, so, so they're available for everybody everybody that needs to come, and uh, so that's a really nice entry point to, to learn about, and in that we'll, we'll also cover all the types of teaware, and some places you could get some of them. There are not, you know, many traditions left boiling tea, so there's not many people selling boiled tea teaware around. So you got to, you know, we had to design it ourselves, or you can convert some other types of antique teaware to boiled tea, which we'll talk about in the course. Is any tea good boiled? Is any tea good? You, should, you guys should take the course and not... We should maybe not talk too much about boiled tea because I don't want to, uh, um, I don't want to like recover all of that. Um, no, not all teas are great boiled. I mean, you know, at the, a lot has changed between the time when tea was regularly boiled and now. So, um, you know, since pretty much the Ming Dynasty, it's been the mainstream the mainstream approach to tea in China has been to steep tea. So as that happened, especially in the Qing, most of what we, um, most of the types of tea that we, uh, that are available to us today, they're, you know, they're processing them and, and at least the matching of that processing with that varietal begins in the, in the Qing and, or sooner, like Qing to now. So a lot of teas, you know, weren't created with that intention, so they're not ideal. I guess technically you could boil any tea, but, you know, teas are, they've just shifted, right? So even, you know, like if you go to Japan, 
uh, you may be familiar with sencha, and even this word sencha means simmered tea. Right? So, you know, because it was all boiled back in the day, uh, but, you know, they've also been steeping it for long, and, and that has shifted the whole industry. These types of shifts can happen very quickly. Um, you know, the port market is a real... Um, is a real indicator of just how quickly these things can shift because, you know, when my tea journey started in the 90s, poor lovers, you know, we did not, I didn't know anyone that consumed any young sheng poor. It just wasn't done. Like, you drank young sheng tea for only two reasons. One was to determine whether it was a candidate for long-term storage or two, to see how it, it was aging. And even then, it was often just like one or two steepings and <laughs> put it aside. It was not, you know, or a little bit, little bit. it wasn't um, something drunk for enjoyment. And so the only criteria for evaluating a young sheng tea was its ageability, its candidacy for long-term aging. There's a lot of reasons for this. I mean, Yangsheng is cold. Um, Chinese people tend to have cold bodies. I mean, cold in traditional Chinese medicine. And so, you know, that. But also, aged poor was, is, is so much better, and it was widely available and not crazy expensive like it is now. It was cheap. So you could, you know, why drink Yangsheng when you can drink 70-year-old poor for very affordably, oh, very affordable prices every day? And... Yeah, and that just like that. So, so even if you look at the government records of Yunnan, for example, um, even I think it's up to like 2004, the production that is recorded is actually a fraction of what it would be by today's standards because they didn't include Yangsheng. It was considered unfinished tea, which still needed to be aged. So uh, it still needed to be fermented. And, and, they, it's kind of like, you know, the mash in whiskey. It's like the raw stuff, and then it has to be barreled, and, and, and there's different laws in different countries. In the United States, it's, it has to be barreled three years before you can even sell it. So they, they, their production listed, in, according to the government, was just show, because the sheng still had, you know, to be fermented. But then, you know, people began to start to find reasons to enjoy young sheng, um, Reasons, you know, main economic reasons that the price of HT started to skyrocket and it started to become more rare. But also there are wonderful qualities in Yangsheng that are worth exploring and worth um, enjoying in their, for their own sake. There, once you let go of just that scale of evaluating the tea based on ageability, uh, there's things to enjoy. Also, you know, up until the, also Yunnan started opening. And so what started happening is like all types, different regions, different mountains in Yunnan that, you know, they've always had tea. They've had tea for thousands of years and the aboriginals from those places, of course, drunk tea. But that tea from those regions wasn't available to like a wider audience. It wasn't available to anybody international, you know, it wasn't available to to us lovers to try and so all different species of trees different varietals different um, you know approaches to tea by different tribes and you, you know there's all kinds of um, things to explore and all of that began to open up too but the result is that in the last 20 years the 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 as young sheng has taken over consumption right almost nobody's consuming aged poor anymore they're consuming young sheng exclusively and so that has caused producers to start to adapt their processing towards that. So they're adapting production towards immediate consumption. And actually, you know, the other thing that's happening is as the price of, of the raw material in Yunnan rises and the tea itself becomes more and more valuable and the producers start to accumulate wealth and invest in machinery and production skills because the production of poor has always been very crude and simple. 
most teas, like oolong, for example, the quality of a tea is about half in the raw material, the, the, the terroir, the trees, the leaf, and half in the skill of the processors. But poor is not like that. The quality of poor traditionally is, you know, 90% the type of garden, the mountain, and, and the trees, and only 10% the processing. And the processing has always been done kind of simply and crudely. So as, but as these, these, you know, as the producers, the farmers, the, these Aboriginal people accumulate some wealth and are investing in the future of their, their tea, they're investing in machinery, but they're also investing in skill, and they're doing so along lines of, of, like, of consumption. So you have a lot of teas. You know, we do tea reviews uh, we, uh, for 20-some years. We've done tea reviews for Chinese magazines, and um, nowadays we're just doing for one. We were doing for several, but now we're just doing for one. So these reviews come regularly, and we even have a word for uh, a type of for a type of poor that we call pulongs, which are basically just, you know all poor tea is, is withered, so it is semi-oxidized, but the oxidation is higher. This can be accidental. Um, again, the production of poor is crude, and it is still crude in some places. So. This can be uh, this can be caused by um, they stuff too many leaves into the bag because they're paid by weight the pickers so they like maybe push the leaves down as they're picking and the leaves get too tightly compressed or they carry the bag and sometimes they're lazy or something and they go for a drink or something while the tea's still in the bag instead of taking it back to the processing facility and it sits in the bag too long sometimes even overnight. So that would be more, that would be accidental causes. But then there's a lot of intentional production of that type where they're like, they're trying to make the tea more fruity, more delicious, more, you know, the, or light. They're choosing varietals from the wild that are like sour and light. And some of that can be good even for long-term aging, but some of those teas are just better consumed young. And so there's a lot of, of that shift has happened just you can see how when the taste and the brewing method in the market changes, how quickly the tea itself can change. Um, and then, you know, when you extrapolate that, the question was like, you know, about boiling tea and you extrapolate that to hundreds of centuries of not nobody really boiling tea. And you get you can you can see the trajectory is much bigger. The scope is much wider than even just these last 20 years in those shifts in poor. We actually just released, uh, and, and we're releasing a whole video on it. We just released a cake of tea called uh, Heavenly Rhyme. That's not our name. It's a little translation, Tianyun. And uh, it's a 2007 Bulang tea from, from Wild Trees. And it's um, kind of unique. Now, it's interesting that the like traditional approach to tea is becoming, uh, a, the traditional approach to poor and its evaluation is, is starting to become the minority. So this is a cake that was created by old school poor lovers for old school poor, poor lovers. It's a cake that was designed to be aged. So it's, it's built from the ground up, you could say, on the criteria that governed poor for centuries. So it's, it's you know, what was a quality shang poor was a shang poor that would be good for long-term aging. And that tea has all of those characteristics. And so... So if you're looking for a, to taste something that's a little more traditional, a little more geared towards long-term storage and what such a cake should look like, taste like, we have that tea up. And I, will, we were about, I recorded a video. It's being edited, so we'll release a video pretty soon talking about or going into some depth about that cake and about the, this, um, this difference. But... It just gives you an idea of how, like in 20 years, how quickly, when the taste of the market changes, how quickly the um, things can shift gear, right? There's also optimism in that too, because um, for example, um, you know, this is a foreshadowing November's issue, which is gonna be amazing. Um, the, the whole issue of, of uh, sustainability, you know, I, around, you know, so many tea mountains, the question that, that keeps repeating, and it's always, you know, even though I've heard the same answer so many dozens of times from farmers, I still 
we'll ask it again because it's a question that's near the lips of most of us who really care is, you know, what can we do to help steer the tea industry more in a direction of sustainability? Because no matter how you approach tea, whether it's a, like a practice for you, a, an aspect of self-cultivation, or it's a hobby, or it's a beverage, no matter what it is for you, you, we cannot afford it to be produced in an unsustainable way. If it's a beverage, why wouldn't we want it to be a healthy one? And if it's a beverage, you know, in all of these circumstances, really tea is a luxury. And we're well beyond the point where we can afford as a species, where, where this planet can afford luxuries that come at the expense of the environment. It's just not uh, ethical to, you know, I personally, my stance is a little more strong. I, I think we need to move towards sustainability in every area of life. And, and that, that's an absolute uh, certainty that we, we need to do that. However, I, I, I could sit at a table and have a meaningful discussion with somebody about sustainability versus necessity. So, you know, in those cases, you can see it starts to there starts to be room for compromise, I guess, or dialogue. Personally, not in my life, but in, a, in an open discussion, you could see how, like, what I mean is that, like, if the, if the only, if, if, this is just purely hypothetical, I don't believe this, but let's say someone's position was that the only way that they could feed their population, for example, in this arid place was if they used some conventional farming. Then you can see the argument becomes a little bit, oh, well, you know, is it is that is that true? Do they really need that to survive? And if so, you can see where you gotta like then, hmm, you know, well, then if that actually was the case, then we need to maybe come up with some new advances in agricultural science so that they can feed that same population without the need for those agrochemicals. But the compromise in that situation makes a bit more sense because if the decision is between like survival of these people because of a necessity like food and the need for chemical fertilizers, for example, then it's a little bit more tricky. But when we're talking about a luxury, like something you drink as a hobby or a beverage or, you know, something just, to, you know, and it's not a necessity, then though, you know, tea was a necessity in, in ancient China, I think, you know, for most of us can agree it's, it's not necessary for our survival. And so there's just no excuse for it to be unsustainable. And, and yet when I ask all the farmers, what can we can do about that? Their answer is always the same. You don't need to do anything with us. Educate the consumer. Farmers know they're the first victims of the chemicals. They're the ones, you know, the, some of the greatest proponents of organic farming in Japan, Korea, Taiwan, anywhere you go are people whose family, whose relatives or themselves have suffered. Either they suffered uh, physical problems or their wife had miscarriages or someone in their family died from pesticide exposure. The WHO says hundreds of thousands of people died from pesticide exposure every year. It's insane. Um, so farmers know. And if the, so as we were talking about earlier about the market shifting really quickly due to taste. So as people start consuming young sheng, young sheng production starts to shift in that direction very quickly. Imagine if all consumers were more educated and started to demand organic sustainable tea. It's, you know, the moment that that demand is, is, is an essential part of tea production, of course all the farmers quit. And they, and they do so, you know, they know, they don't spray that stuff on their own vegetable gardens. So they know how and they, they have access or they have access to the, the um, tools to learn how to organically farm and they can they can make that shift. And so it's really about demand. It's about the education of the consumer. And it's about, you know, taking a stance without being judgmental. I'm not judgmental of those who sell unsustainable tea. I love them just as, you know, they're also humans and trying to do the best they can. I don't appreciate when they, um, when they distract from the issue, like, like a magician, you know, it's like, look over here at my hand while I move the coin over here. Like, you know, I, I'm a little bit more straightforward person. And I like kind of like things down to earth and plain. And 
I think you know it's common sense that that these things are ideal and that anybody you know when you ask these vendors they're just like blah, 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 and they start spouting stuff but what it really boils down to of course is just money bottom line they can't find the sustainable tea of the type or quality that they want in order to make the profit margins that they want in order to meet their um, their bottom line and you know the, but for me personally, those are co not compromises I'm willing to make. And I'm still surrounded by clean tea. So if you make that kind of hard line and you help educate, spread and, and continue this discussion and, and open this discussion more and more and more, you can see how the more this, this conversation is happening, the more that, that how, the quicker that market can just can really shift very quickly into new, new uh, areas. So there's optimism in that ability of the market to shift very quickly as well. Chaz is asking, with so much tea on your site, how do we know what teas are best for us at our current place in our tea exploration? Should we explore one genre deeply at a time or try more classic e examples of everything? <laughs> As I was saying, with a lot of tea, so much tea out there, how do you know like what to explore? Um, do you go deep into one genre or do you taste little bits of every genre? I think, you know, both of those are great approaches to exploration. So, um, there's a fly. Uh, you know, it, that's just like, it's just like a, um, I don't know, like you could say an education, like a, the same way that like um, when you first go to college, your your courses as a freshman are very, uh, the scope is very wide, but the depth is very shallow. So your first kind of couple years of college, you have to take a lot of classes. You have to take some sciences and some languages and some, um, you know, social studies and some literature and you have to, and some math and some, duh, 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 duh. and then you start to like specify and go deep into the thing, the areas that you're most interested in as you choose a major. So in the same way, like, you know, it's good to ha get a little bit of uh, some information about um, all the types of tea. And then, you know, the ones that really appeal to you, that uh, sit well with you, um, you can start to jump more deeply into them. Uh, we, we, we will continue to try and make little, like, we're trying our best to make every tea um, available in like sample sizes as well in smaller packets and to m continue to make like educational sets. Like now we have up a, a, a storage set so you can learn about the storage of poor. We have two 20 year old poors, one's wet stored and one's dry stored. And we're about to release a video about that. And the wet stored one in fact is the tea of the month for this October, the replica of purple sky. So um, that's, we're going to try and make more of those kind of educational dives. And um, our plan also, this is foreshadowing, a little bit ahead, but our plan actually um, for the foreseeable year is to continue these online courses and the direction that we're going after the boiled tea course is actually down this the road that you're asking about. So um, so that the the after this boiled tea course, the next two courses are most likely going to be a, a, tea, a course on the seven genres of tea. That will be like, you know, good solid like 10 hours into the seven into the seven or maybe seven hours or you know i don't know actually the length but it'll be you know seven or eight lectures long long lectures diving into all the types of tea and then um i think we'll do a, a really heavy deep dive into poor so a good you know also like 10 hour course on on poor tea and go deeper than we ever have and so uh we hope to provide some some of that type of education and of course the magazines are there as well 100, 100 more than 100 issues and they dive really deep and, and extremely geekily into the geek all the geeky details of, of tea but as you suggested you can't learn just by reading or watching courses you have to drink a lot of tea too and um you know i also would follow the bliss a little bit follow the passion a little bit so um you know, listen to your body, to your senses, and and as you try lots of kinds of tea, then you find one of them is like really resonating with you, and 
that type of tea is really, you know, it's pulling you in. And then you'll be passionate to explore. So yet your tea journey doesn't ever have, you know, really be a chore or... Uh, so I feel like, you know, if you're... If it's all just kind of really distant play and there's not, then it's not really a practice. But if it's all like a chore either, then it's not really a practice either. So it kind of has to have the passion to really drive, drive us forward. There's got to be a love. So it's kind of, you know, maybe my suggestion is like try lots of different types and tell you, it keep trying lots of different types until you land on a type of tea that's really like pulling you in that you're super interested in and that, so that your exploration will be fueled by a, a love and a, and a passion and a delight and fun it should be fun yeah it's suggested to dedicate tea word to types of tea if possible do you think there is value to dedicating teaware based on the five elements? So it's suggested to dedicate teaware to, to certain types of tea. There's not, it's not teaware, it's, it's Yixing teapots in Gongfu tea. So um, the specify that, first of all. So in Gongfu tea brewing, um, there is a value in dedicating an Yixing pot to a particular type of tea. Um, and to cover the entire spectrum, you need 15. And those are actually listed in the Yixing issue, which is uh, September 17, is that right? September 17, 2017. And, um, and that's on our website for free, so go check it out. And, and it has a list of the, of the dedications. So, um, no, you don't, you don't need to, it, there's not a, there's not a, um, I think I know what you mean is from the like 10 day course, I went into the types of tea and basics of, of where they land elementally. And that will, if you do get, if you do get 15 eating pots and you map them in the way that's suggested in the magazine, then the elements will also be mapping. They will also be um, kind of charted in that way. So that'll happen kind of naturally as you separate um, teapots, you you will be separating separating also along elemental lines just naturally, but you don't need to really focus on that. I focus more just on the type of tea, um, and you don't have to do that. Um, there are benefits to doing so certainly, but it's not essential. So if you are going to um, if you are going to use, let's say you just have one eating pot, your first pot, you're going to have to use it for all tea. So then. Two suggestions. First of all, don't ever leave any leaves in it, even f for any time. So immediately at the end of every session, make sure you clean it out uh, immediately. Don't walk away with the leaves in the pot ever. And you will need to scour it every like six months. And scouring, how to scour an Yixing pot is also in the, that Yixing issue. So you can follow the instructions there. Um, so you need to scour it every six months or so. Uh, the reason being it's very porous, so it absorbs the oils from the tea. Um, but other than that, you can. And then, you know, if, once you get a second pot, you start making the first division, which is kind of like you could say light and dark teas. And then slowly do, 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 start getting into... 15 includes like lots of miscellaneous uses. You don't really need 15. 15 just covers every angle of every possible use that you could have for an aging pot. But even dedicating, a, even dedicating a, an aging pot to uh, a particular kind of tea you still need to, there, there's still a decision to be made because there's still um, benefits and losses in both directions. So let's say, you know, I have 15 pots and I've dedicated this particular Yixing pot to aged oolongs, for example. There's a, there's a benefit of, of like seasoning it over the course of my life, um, especially energetically as it starts to absorb the juju of, of lots of tea sessions. But on the level of, uh, kogan of the mouthfeel of the like, qualities of, of the tea like once a year or once every two years scouring is actually better because th those oils are actually clogging the pores of the of the yeasting pot which are affecting its capillary action 
which are is affecting also the interaction of the clay with the tea. Um, and so there's a benefit to like resetting it as well to cleaning it. But then you're losing some of that like magic of the like the seasoning and the juju and the and the energetic depth. So you really um, uh, I tend to lean this way. I tend to like seasoning them. Maybe that'll change. I don't know. My teacher tends to like cleaning them. He used to do this. No, he he more he wants this more a little bit. So um, there's a middle ground too, where you don't like, you know, you, you just every few years give it a like. I do this. This is more where I go. I tend to stay over here. I I love the seasoning process, and I love the juju and the energy of that, and the watching that happen brings me great joy, and noticing those changes brings me great joy. So I tend to go that way. And then for some of my pots, there's kind of a middle ground where you, you like scour it, but not so heavy. Just a little bit on the inside or something, you know. So to open the pores is a little, little bit up. But, but certainly, I mean, I've done experiments and there is certainly an advantage to that too. So the whole, that whole structure of like every, an interesting for every type of tea, and even that has to really is a, ultimately will come down to a loss and a win in you can't have the best of both worlds. Matt is asking, when beginning a new lifestyle change or habit, what lessons can we learn from our tea sessions that assist with the motivation to make these changes? So when making lifestyle changes, what can we learn from our ceremony, our tea practice to help assist us in the, yeah, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think that uh, one area maybe where tea can, can help when we start making changes, uh, and this is just me throwing something out, I don't, I don't really know the answer to this question, but um, I guess uh, tea can be kind of a little bit like a gauge. You know, it's kind of like when a tea lover changes their diet, maybe, let's say, let's take something more gross as an example. I think that there's maybe a tendency to experience the effects of the diet maybe quicker. Whereas like maybe somebody who's not without a tea practice has to wait maybe, I don't know, a few months and then they start to notice differences. The tea person might notice it immediately because the, you know, the, the tea will change and the experience of the tea will change. So I think that's a really powerful thing is like if you start m making um, positive, healthy lifestyle changes in your life, your tea will immediately like start to reward you for it. It, it I guess it, it like it's it, it, in the sense that like you're getting your vision corrected or getting your hearing corrected as an analogy, right? Um, let's say, you know, you, you get a, let's say, you know, it's in the future and there's some kind of corrective surgery for hearing, which I hope there is one day. So those who do have hearing problems can have it. Um, and you're, you know, like maybe an ordinary person doesn't break it. It takes them a few months to realize, hey, my hearing's actually improved. But somebody who like listens to music every day and is, like is me is into hi-fi, that person is probably going to notice the effects of the, of the treatment the very next day. Because they're, they've been sitting down listening to the, you know, listening carefully and sharply to their uh, stereo system. And then all of a sudden the hearing's changed. Oh, and like, you know, in, in hi-fi, there's a lot of, just like in tea, there's a lot of very subtle things. The effect of a pot, the effect of a kettle, the effect of what the pot is sitting on. There's a lot of really subtle, subtle things. And so, that, you know, that's there in every art. And when you start out, you only notice the gross things. But like, you know, when you give a chef uh, a, a spoonful of some soup, they're like, and they're like, oh, too much cinnamon. Uh, the salt, you know, they can taste all the little things that, you know, maybe somebody who's not so interested in cooking, you, you maybe can't, you, you just, it's, everything's a little bit more gross. 
So the more you go, every path is a movement from the gross to the subtle. So the more you get into, you know, let's say hi-fi, I'm into hi-fi, then, you know, you like a little movement of a little cable and the change in the sound is very subtle. But if you know how to listen, boom, there it is. Oh, it's changed. It's different, right? And then you like that or not? It's the next question, right? So same with tea, like, you know, just a different pot, different shape of pot, sitting on a different thing, different brewing methods. There's so much to explore. And, you know, eventually, like in, in the, what I think makes this a practice of self-cultivation is that, like all true art, you begin to realize that the most important instrument in the art is yourself. So, you know, as Michelangelo said, the artist must be as much as possible a saint so that through her comes God, you know. And so that's just a way of saying that, like, more important than the brush the brushes that you use or the types of pigment or where you get your canvas or how it's stretched more important than all of that to to the painting is the painter and so the you know same in tea more important than the tea or the teaware or the water is the one who's brewing in their mind and the more you become sensitive the more tea is going to reflect back to you um, the type of mind that made it and so you might be, re be rewarded immediately if the lifestyle change that you're talking about making is a positive one. Other than that, my advice, I, I don't know that this comes from, you know, tea practice, but, um, you know, when in the, in, there's the old Indian saying, right? In the beginning of things, association is paramount. So it means that... Um, when we begin new habits that are positive, we need to, we need support. We need to find support. We need to find, I guess, you know, others that are maybe more deeply entrenched in those positive habits or understand them or are at least supportive of our um, desire to make those changes in our lives so that we can, we can feel supported in that new, um, in that new journey, we need to feel supported. That's the only thing I don't know. You had to maybe ask that to your tea and to your tea practice as well. Maybe there's other answers, but um, as far as I know, it's a very good question. I'm sorry, I'm just not. Uh, I, don't, I don't feel. Um, I don't feel like a a question that I can answer more deeply than that other than to say that there might be a way in which tea can reflect back to you the progress. Corey is asking, uh, what tea are you drinking today? Now, what tea am I drinking today? I'm drinking uh, Red Cloud, which is the... Um, I'm drinking Red Cloud, which is one of um, uh, two uh, aged yen hongs that we have up on the website that we found recently. They're both really cool. We have a, a um, video about them actually up that you could go watch. One's called Red Pine. Um, Red Pine's really amazing. It's a 90s yen hong, so it's a well aged yen hong you can taste, which is really cool. It's named after one of my favorite authors, who's also a Gopal Tiet member, Red Pine, who's, you know, amongst the most influential authors in my life. So it's time to have a tea named after him. We, of course, sent one to some, some of the tea to him. And he's very appreciative. Uh, and Red Cloud is a little bit younger and not as old. This, this Red Cloud is not as old as Red Pine, not as deep, but it's stored a little bit more cleanly and um, also has some really wonderful qualities. So, yeah, I enjoy both of them quite a bit and, and regularly, often. I've been drinking a lot of them since we found them. They're both pretty highly recommended, though, especially Red Pine. Red Pine... Uh, I have drunk it bowl tea, but I more often would prepare that tea gongfu. 
uh, but they're both they're both just really special and they it's you know they both have really a lot of really good qualities but red pine in particular is is become amongst my favorite dan homes in my life actually uh a few that we have another one serenity that's also really uh, up there very high on my uh on my list as well and my favorite dan home ever is joy some of you have had joy joy is just uh, such a, an amazing beautiful wonderful special tea and then uh, I do like Serenity a lot. Um, Serenity is really good in, in, for Balti. And then, yeah, it's hard to choose maybe between Serenity and Red Pine. They both, they're very different teas, but um, I like a little wet storage and Red Pine has a little bit of wet storage too. I like a little bit of that in my tea. So as like most old school kind of uh, old timers like dinosaurs like myself, like a little bit of traditional storage. All right, well, we'll wrap it up now and uh, thank you guys for coming and sharing some beautiful discussions and, and uh, exploration together learning together i love learning about tea and and uh trying to discuss it with you guys and uh, your questions are deep and profound even one of today went way over my head uh and uh that's you know something i'll take that question and it'll be something i'll think about more and more over the coming weeks so i appreciate it and uh appreciate the time and the chance to use technology to connect if you haven't yet, there was a lot of questions about boiled tea. It seems like you guys are excited about it. Please go sign up for the course. I'm, I'm super excited. I, I just can't wait to, um, to go so deep into really. It's just one of my favorite brewing methods. So ancient and powerful and rich and full of, uh, you know, full of history and juju and and it also, as I said, it just unlocks things in tea that aren't available otherwise. And that's just that's there even on a chemical level, even on a on a flavor level. Um, I'd say all the really the top five bowls of tea that I've ever had in my life were all came from boiled tea. Sometimes, especially really deep into a boiled session, out comes this like <laughs> this like club cloud burst of beauty of beauty from the tea, and smoothness and richness and flavor and aroma and energy that just is you know unavailable. And sometimes you have to be really patient. Some of those, like, you know, probably I'd say the top three bowls of tea I've had in my life were hours and hours into a boiled tea session. So very deep, deep, deep down into, into where it can go. And that's one of the other things that I love about it is that it forces kind of patience and um, slowing down and setting aside time for tea. And it's just really wonderful. It's a wonderful way to share tea with other people, too. It's a very... Um, social it can be it's very it's a wonderful way to create a, a vibe of, of sharing and we're going to go over that in the course actually including um you know when we always we go out and serve roadside tea we haven't been recently obviously we're in a pandemic but uh we go out regularly and serve roadside tea and the best way to serve roadside tea is boiled tea so it's a really wonderful way to even like we're going to go over that in the course to go set up you know set yourself up somewhere on the road and serve tea to passersby is a wonderful experience you make a lot of friends that way. So it's going to be exciting to, to take the course and, uh, and, uh, and to be there with all you guys and learning and, and exploring boiled tea together. So I encourage you to go sign up. And if you haven't yet, sign up for Global Tea Hut. Uh, the November issue actually is uh, that's coming up is going to be one of the most epic Global Tea Huts ever, if not the most epic Global Tea Hut ever. It's really cool. Um, it's something that's... I think two years in the planning, something like that. It's been going, a discussion of it actually has been going on for like six years, like as long as Global Tea Hut, there's been a discussion of this. So, uh, but the actual like planning of it has taken a long time and it's just such a beautiful, epic thing and really wonderful experience. And I can't wait to, for everybody to have it. Um, in fact, it's so important this November issue <laughs> 
that actually the November issue and all the special things that it comes with are going to stay on the website after that month so that people will be able to like purchase it indefinitely. That's how important it is. You'll be like, it's just, it's unlike anything we've ever done. It's really special. I'm very, very excited. So now is a really excellent time to sign up for Global TN if you haven't yet. So have a wonderful day, week, month. Drink lots of really rad tea. Stay positive, stay peaceful, stay heart-centered. And thanks for joining us.